Well, I see a lot of familiar faces here this evening, and I'm really thrilled that you were all able to take time out of your busy days, evenings, works, even away from families, to spend a little time uh, together. Also, the camaraderie is always amazing. Um, and I always want to make sure that we have interesting, relevant uh, information, ways to take care of our patients. And as I've always said, rising tides raise all boats. And that's what the MSRI is really about. To that degree, just to let you know, um, is Dale and their group from Lucky Airlines has been uh, doing videography for our, our meetings. We now have an MSRI uh, YouTube channel. I'll be sending an email out to you. And our last four uh, presentations will all be there. So you can tell the folks that missed a great dinner, good camaraderie. Um, that they'll be able to listen over and over and over again to our presenters. Um, I'm sure our speaker tonight will be thrilled to know that that may happen. But um, this evening, I um, want to talk about a subject and have a, a great discussion, a real talk about an area in our field that's just exploding in terms of interest, not only from us as, as scientists, physicians, uh, and specialists, but from the consumer aspect of this, in terms of patients' expectations, everyone wants a perfect baby. Everyone wants a baby the very first attempt that they do things. And we've all, or some of us heard, have heard of um, the term Six Sigma. Has anyone heard of the term Six Sigma? So the Sigma's uh, standard deviations from the mean and six standard deviations from the mean is what Toyota came out with. They have a car that had a one in a million error in measurements. And we expect Six Sigma in our reproduction. The only thing is, God didn't get the memo. And that's a problem. So if God doesn't get the memo, then we're trying to help our patients navigate to meet their expectations, best as humanly possible. And that's really what the dialogue tonight's about, because the technologies are advancing. There are more companies jumping into the pool into the deep end to say, we're offering genetic screening, we're offering genetic screening. And then you start to wonder, well, what kind of genetic screening is being offered? How is it being applied? And as physicians, how do we counsel our patients about this? Who do we de decide to partner with to, to access that technology? What confidence do we have? Where do the genetic counselors come into this? Is there a difference between genetic counselors from the scientific part of technology, from genetic counselors that are clinical genetic counselors? Just because there's genetic counseling doesn't mean it's all the same for everybody. And I know personally that my expectations were that genetic counseling, even though I've worked with genetic counselors, just did the whole gamut of things. But as we granulate in our technology to understand more and delve deeper into differences uh, down to single nucleotides, the granulation of that starts to, in a sense, get fuzzy between what's the difference between siblings and what's disease? And how do we counsel our patients for what we all have classically seen now is reduced risk, not no risk. So to challenge our expectations and promises made to being promises kept, um, our speaker this evening, I thought, uh, is, is just a great uh, uh, ambassador to challenge these settled ideas because we like things to be set and then we want to move on and not think about it anymore. But the moment we stop thinking about it, we're doing a disservice to our patients. And I'm really looking forward to the dialogue this evening. So many of you may know our speaker tonight, Mark Evans. Uh, gosh, he is, uh, has been an a, uh, icon in our field and uh, worldwide and also in our community for 17 years at Wayne State, being the former chairman uh, of OBGYN. He's a professor at Mount Sinai uh, Hospital in New York, and he's been the president of the Fetal um, uh, Maternal Foundation uh, and Alliance, and he's the past president of the Central Association. He has been so involved on so many facets of uh, maternal fetal medicine and genetics. And in fact, his true love was genetics. And he had the foresight many, many, many years ago to see that the pathway to really being able to assess, uh, assist people was in the prenatal assessment aspect of it. And that drew him to obstetrics and gynecology and seeing that as an application. But not only from the genetic side, he's also been a real pioneer in in utero uh, fetal surgery, 
uh, being uh, a real key collaborator to the clo first uh, surgery to close the diaphragm uh, from an open uh, fetal diaphragm in utero. So a pioneer on so many levels. So it uh, is with uh, uh, great pride and certainly great distinction that I introduce to you Mark Evans. Mark. Thank you. Can you guys hear me without the mic? Yeah. Okay. That's actually, it's, huh? no, I've got this one on, don't worry. Great. Gotcha. It's, a, it's always a pleasure to come home. I mean, I spent, uh, you know, half of my career here, I raised my kids here. Actually, uh, my daughter and Mike's son went to Roper together for, many, for a number of years. So it's, uh, it's welcome to be home. But now I'm back where I, I ri I'm originally from New York, okay? So I, I speak the language, I'm back there again. Uh, <laughs> actually, this picture was taken this 9-11. I, 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 we live in, I tell people I live in New York and I sleep in New Jersey. Remember a couple of years ago the GW Miss uh, Bridge fiasco with Christie? That was me stuck in the damn traffic. It, he's not one of my fans and, vi and vice versa. But in any event, on 9-11 they still have the memorial lights. It makes great pictures. Uh, this actually was from the night of Hurricane Sandy in 2000, 2012. <coughs> and it's remarkable because that's the last time I did a vaginal delivery. And it was in my apartment building. <laughs> I got a phone call from the front desk about 1 o'clock in the morning. A doctor, uh, could you come down to apartment, you know, so and help? Turns out one, the ambulance couldn't get there. Now, Mom was a pediatrician, so we both managed to get through it fairly unscathed. <laughs> but, I mean, I had not done routine obstetrical call. I mean, when I, was, when I was at Hutzel, I took routine faculty call. And, you know, did thousands of deliveries back in, back in those days. But have tried to stay away from that as much as I can. But in any event, what I want to talk to, I, when, when Mike asked me to give this talk, I was trying to <laughs> figure out, as in three days ago, okay, I agreed to this, what the hell am I going to say? And I decided you don't need a PGD talk from me. You guys li live that every day. But what you don't see is what I, as a obstetrical geneticist, see is the pregnancies you guys make and how they get through the first, second, and third trimester. And there's nothing more tragic than a, a woman who's undergone years of infertility, maybe multiple cycles of IVF, PGD, whatever, and then turns out to have a baby with a cardiac defect. Okay, you know, basically getting chopped down at the last second. And unfortunately, we see far more of that than we'd like to imagine. Now, in my, in my full fetal reduction talk, I have a slide of Mariana Rivera you know, pitching and basically saying what we've done in my program for years is basically pitch the ninth inning for you guys, which is deal with the, you know, with, with the, uh, you know, too many. And then we're actually now pitching also the eighth inning and doing a lot of the bunch of the genetic studies. But we have to begin to think about this in a different rubric. And the, uh, and the concept that came to mind, of course, was the old concept of, you know, the elephant to the blind man. Everybody actually sees things very differently depending upon your perspective. Now, if you're an epidemiology and a public health person, you're thinking about the overall impact of birth defects. I'll come to those numbers in a minute. Regular OBGYNs want to think about it in terms of the overall pregnancy care. You guys are heavily focused on getting a selected group of patients pregnant. As an OB geneticist, we want to make sure that what they've got is what they want to take home and that it's healthy. MFM, radiology, et cetera, all see things somewhat differently. <coughs> now, basically what you guys see is you're dealing with a small proportion of the overall population that has a sp specific infertility needs. Genetics are either a secondary issue, given that you've got the embryo anyway, we debate do we do PGD, or for a small percentage of patients, you know, basically like Dr. Hughes' program, you're getting embryos from people who are not necessarily infertile, but have specific genetic needs and, for example, cannot tolerate the concept of even a first trimester termination where they've been through three of them already and they just simply can't do it again for a, you know, a high risk issue. And, the, but the re, and basically the reality is, from a public health point of view, it's still a fairly small percentage of all the patients. However, the reality is that genetics really should be a much more important part of your overall programs than frankly it has been. Okay, now, so what's the problem? Overall worldwide, 
there are about 140 million births. About 6% of them, or about 8 million babies, are born with birth defects. That's not even counting the minuscule fraction that have prenatal diagnosis and choose to not continue. On top of that, there's several hundred thousand with post-conceptional or teratogen problems, whether it be alcohol, rubella, syphilis. In, in much of China, <coughs> there is a tremendous iodine deficiency, and you have and cretinism is just rampant in the middle, middle of China. Three million babies die under age five. Another three million are disabled for life, and only a tiny percentage of these overall are found prenatally. Now, we keep talking about Down syndrome, Down syndrome, Down syndrome. The reality is the single biggest category of birth defects are cardiac. Over a million babies with cardiac disorders born every year. Now, thanks to the advances in fetal cardi in, in, you know, in, in fetal echocardiography, it used to be that 80% of babies with cardiac defects were surprises in the nursery. Now, overall, more than half of them are found prenatally. Okay? And putting the pro-choice issues aside for the moment, even if you're going to, you know, if you're from Gaylord or some of the other small towns up in the UP, maybe that's not the best place to have that baby. You should be down here at one of the major medical centers. And that has tremendously improved the overall outcome of those kinds of cases. There are 300,000 neural tube defects, something that we hardly ever see anymore. In this country, uh, since we began supplementing breads and grains with folic acid supplementation in, 19, in 1998, the incidence of primary neural tube defects has been cut by more than half. And recurrence has been cut by two thirds. Okay? They just started in, in Brazil, however, they used to have hundreds of these babies every year. And now they're just beginning to do folic acid supplementation there. Hemoglobinopathies, over 300,000. Down syndrome is only 20% of the total of cardiac disease. Yet no patient of yours, unless they've had a family history, comes into you or comes into their OB and says, Oy, I'm concerned about having a baby with a heart defect. All they think about is Down syndrome. Okay? Now, we all were taught, or at least those of us who have some gray hair, that, you know, necessity was the mother of invention. In reality, the last 20, 30 years, it's now invention is the mother of necessity. Nobody needed a fax machine until all of a sudden it was invented. I had the first fax machine at Hutzel Hospital. And Bob Sokol, who was the OB chair at the time, said to me, what, do you, what am I paying for a telephone line for that for? What do I need this for? And within three days, his secretary was in my office six hours a day using the fax machine. <laughs> Until two weeks later, she got it all by herself. The same thing was true for the cell phone. And remember the grief Steve Jobs got over the iPad? Who needs that? Let me ask a question. Who doesn't have an iPad in this room? 10%. Okay. You've answered my question. Okay. From a genetics point of view, genetics is <laughs> information to science business. <laughs> As Mike said, I actually was interested in genetics back from high school, even before I was interested in OB. And two things happened. I actually wound up working as a summer lab tech and did the first AFPs in this country back in, this, in the early 1970s. And as for those of you who know me, uh, you, I don't think most people would say I have the personality of a pediatrician. You know, it's more of a surgical type. So there, and it became clear to me that the action was going to be prenatal. And that's what made sense to me. Now, one of my mentors and close friends for many years was John Fletcher, who was the bioethicist at the NIH. Now, John used to speak in this haunting monotone. Those of you, who, there's some people in this room I know who, who, who knew him. And the reason for that was he was the brother of Louise Fletcher, Nurse Ratchet from Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> Remember how she used to talk? Yeah, seriously. They were both raised by deaf parents. Their father was a Baptist preacher to the deaf community in Alabama. And so they were never exposed to at home all the intonations of voice that we all became accustomed to. And that's how John could speak in this gripping thing and Nurse Ratchet could basically get, you know, Jack Nicholson to keel over. Okay? 
in terms of what it was. And I actually, John actually wrote a book back in, this, back in the early 80s that I, I helped him with a little bit when I was a fellow <coughs> on trying to teach genetics to clergy. Back then, and it really hasn't changed, 80% of first marriages and 60% of subsequent ones are performed by clergy. And if those folks would just ask a few simple questions, a lot of suffering could be avoided. I remember my first year at Hutzel had a couple come to see me for counseling, and they were Iraqi and first cousins, which is, you know, is common in their culture. And they had had two children with Crabbe's disease, which for those of you who are not in my business is an autosomal recessive lethal, okay? And the husband got so disgusted with his wife for, quote, giving him these abnormal kids that he divorced her and married her sister. <laughs> And it was one of those times where you're basically sitting at the desk and you're trying to shove your tie into your mouth not to laugh in these people's faces, okay? <laughs> but this is the kind of stuff that, you know, still goes on. And there's no reason why we can't prevent that. And now, with some of the pan-ethnic, you know, 100 million, 100 million diseases for 12 cents panels, if they're done properly, we can actually prevent a lot of this stuff. Now, one of the major criticisms historically about medical research is that we do it on the poor people. And if you're talking about a diabetes medicine or a hypertension medicine, many of our major medical centers are what in now are indigent areas. I mean, I've never heard, I've never heard the DMC described as being in a luxuri luxurious downtown area, but the same is true for Hopkins, Columbia, et cetera, okay? And the funding for that research was primarily academic, grant, or institutional. Patents and intellectual property were a secondary issue. My father-in-law, in the 1960s, working at the Imperial Cancer Research Fund, was the guy who really developed iodination of proteins, okay? As he got gypped out of his share of the Nobel Prize, long story that he, he should have shared with Yalo by moving from, from London to Hawaii. But the point, and it lost all his political chips, but the, basically, I said to him once, why didn't you guys do this? He said, gentlemen scientists didn't do that kind of stuff back in the 1960s. And so he wound up dying a poor academic as opposed to a gazillionaire. But I'm saying, and so what has happened <coughs> is, number one, clinically, with genetics and new technology, it's not the poor people who are getting it, it's the rich people. They're the ones who go on the internet, can get on an airplane, half the patients I see the complex stuff that we do, come by airplane. This last two weeks, for multiples, I've had patients from Germany, Texas, and Florida. I mean, this is what we do. People get on planes to go do the stuff we do. But what's happening now, and this is a relatively new phenomena, is a lot of the research is being done corporately and being done by people who do not come from a medical background, engineers mostly, who do not have the professional ethics that we were trained in to try and figure out what's the appropriate use for technology, and it's bang for the buck, sell it and get out. And that is a huge risk to our patients, and then secondarily to us. Now, in terms of use of new technology, <coughs> it quite honestly follows, in many respects, a red state, blue state divide. I mean, my patients, I say, are the average New Yorkers who want their answer yesterday. Okay, so, you know, it's funny, when I, when I first moved to the Midwest, when I went for my internship, okay, after several months uh, from New York to Chicago, people said to me, well, gee, how do you like it here? And I said, overly simplistically, you know, I like the, the women better and the men less. And it was for the same reason. Everybody was slightly less aggressive and hostile, which was nicer in the women and less interesting in the men. 25 years later, I moved back, and people say, what is it like? I say, well, I feel like I moved back home to Krypton. Under the red sun, things are a little bit different, you know, in terms of, in terms of how we approach things. But what we're seeing <coughs> overall are several important simultaneous trends. Number one, increasing expertise in ultrasound and visualization, okay? Increasing safety of diagnostic procedures like CVS and amniocentesis. A increasing number of genetic screening test possibilities, you know all about that. A shift from cytogenetic to molecular ones. You, you know, if you walk into the bookstore at U of M, 
there'll be a sweatshirt that said, Friend don't, friends don't let friends go to MSU. And if you do it at MSU, don't go to U of M. And I actually had to, took out the slide because with my daughter wearing it, we went to U of M. But the point is, friends don't let friends' kids become classic cytogeneticists. The future is all molecular cytogenetics. Okay? And how, and, but the big issue, the one thing I want you to remember from the slide, is there continues to be a vast underappreciation of the resi residual risks of still having a problem despite a normal screening test. Okay? Now, in this, you remember the TV series Saint Elsewhere back in the 80s? The, young, the youngins are going, what? <laughs> it came from a book called The House of God, which was based on the Beth Israel in Boston. Okay? And there's a line in the book that said there's no body cavity that can't be reached with a 20 gauge needle and a strong arm. Okay? <laughs> well, that was OB genetics in the 70s and 80s. Hold still, I'll put a needle into your uterus. Okay? Now, in fact, the first amnios were done by a guy named Cecil Jacobson. Uh, do you remember about 25 years ago the trial in Virginia of the fertility doc who was using his own sperm? Okay, the new father of our country. I mean, that was Cecil. <laughs> and before he got a hold of himself, he was actually a fairly well respected geneticist. But the bottom line is they began doing him, and the guy who figured out the culture techniques was primarily Henry Nadler, okay? who was the dean at Wayne in the 80s. Okay? He was chairman, he was in, at Northwestern at the time. So in the 80s and 90s, ultrasound got better and we began looking. What happened in the last 15 years is the lab guys have gotten so much better at doing stuff with tissue specimens that has, that has logarithmically increased the number of diagnoses that we can make prenatally in early pregnancy or even pre-implantation. But what's going on now is the la some of the lab guys are saying, who needs the doctor? Who needs the clinician? Okay? And they're basically bypassing the traditional medical routes for some of the things we've been talking about. Now, what's behind the curtain? <laughs> Clinicians don't actually care about the lab test methodology. Okay? We don't. All we want to know is, did you get it right or not? And if you didn't get it right, will you stand behind the doctor when it all hits the fan? Right? And that's the problem with lab companies run by engineers who have no ability to get up in court and explain why this mistake could have happened without it being malpractice. Okay? And that's going to be a huge problem over the next five years as these cases emerged. And then, of course, is the question, well, what's the cost benefit of all these new lab tests? Now. <coughs> Our patients do not understand, and many of our colleagues do not understand, that we have two types of tests. We have diagnostic tests, which are meant to give us a definitive answer. They're commonly expensive. They may have risks, and therefore they're only done on, quote, at-risk patients, whatever that means. As opposed to screening tests, which are meant for everybody, all we're asking them to do is adjust odds, they do not give us a definitive answer. And then the question is, well, when you should be doing this or not. Now, can anybody tell me what the background is on this slide, on this side on the right here? You got it. Right, those are Monet's lily pad fields in Giverny in, in France, okay? Why do I do that for screening tests? We get an impression of what's going on. Okay, what about the background over here? You're on a roll, Ron. No, the hint is it's the same trip. Oh, it's the same trip? Same trip. Right. At, on D-Day at Normandy at Point du Hoc, the Rangers had to climb a 200-foot cliff under heavy machine gun fire to take out those pillboxes. There were like 300 who went up and 100 got killed on the way. Okay? So diagnostic tests are harsh reality, and screening tests are where we get an impression. Now you're going to remember that. Now, we have seen a pendulum of differing primacy over 50 years ago. We started with screening tests. How old are you? That's a great screening test for Down syndrome. Then we went to procedures, amnios, back to AFP, back to CVS. And we are, we are fighting it out now between better screening and better actual diagnostic techniques. 
and the, it, waxes and it continues to wax and wanes. Now, there's the, the old Confucius curse used to be, may you live in interesting times. The major leaps in technology are allowing us, and I would say forcing us, to completely reframe our approach to both screening and diagnosis. Okay? And if you remember one thing from tonight's talk, make it be this slide. Prenatal diagnosis and screening is not just about Down syndrome. We now have to consider all sources of structural and neurologic impairment. Okay, the playing field has gotten a whole lot bigger. Now, interestingly enough, the methodologies have been disparate and they're going to be coming back together. At the beginning, with Mendelian disorders, we had a small number of disorders with simple genetics. Sickle cell, Tay-Sachs disease, okay? Chromosomes were, were no banding or whole resolute or you know, very, very poor banding techniques. I actually spent some time as a student in the lab of Dr. Chio at the NIH, who was the guy who said, I don't think they're 48 chromosomes, I think they're 46. Which of course was complete heresy at the time. Okay. Then we got to expanded targeting panels. Cystic fibrosis went from the delta F508 to 1 to 3 to 5 to 7 to 9 to 11. We're now up to 2000. Okay. Increased resolution on the chromosome side. The beginnings of molecular cytogenetics, fish probes, QFPCR. What we've been in for the past several years is expansive by genotype. Companies like Council, the Inheritest from Integrated, et cetera, you know, a uh, hundred different genotype probes. Okay? How good it is remain to be seen, and there are a lot of problems with that. On the chromosome side, expansive by microarray. Okay? That's what I'm trying to get people to understand how much better it can do than karyotypes. Where we're go going eventually, okay, and not too distant, probably five to ten years is basically exome sequencing for everything, or just about everything. It'll bring back to one methodology that can do virtually everything that needs to be done. Question, of course, is how much is it reasonable to spend on all of these programs? Okay, it's a little bit out of order, but I'll say it now anyway. Uh, what does anybody in this room know how much Michigan Medicaid is paying for nine month OB package these days? Nobody does. Okay, uh, my guess is it's probably around 11. Liz, do you know? Probably 11, 1200. Okay, New York, it's about 3,500. If you're spending a thousand bucks on a free cell-free DNA test, okay, they'll say, oh, but it's not coming out of the budget. No, not this year. Next year, the Medicaid program is going to look and say, wait a minute, we spent all this extra money. Now let's lower the OB fee down to 500 dollars. Okay. That's the real risk to the, to the practicing clinician. Now, in Mendelian disorders, you've had like programs like Council used to say, well, a thousand different disorders, some of the diseases have incidence of one in a million. So should you be screening for disease, more diseases with low frequency or more alleles of less diseases that are more common? The answer from a, from a cost-benefit answer is almost always the more alleles of the common disorders, with the exception of, of the consanguinous couple like the Iraqi couple I talked about, where you get the weird things that keep popping up because of, the, because of the consanguinity. Now, but what's happening is even companies like Council, and I get no vested interest in them, I'm just using that as an example, are all switching from multiple genotypes to sequencing because they have figured out they have no choice. Okay? Classic example, you have a couple where Wife is a carrier for cystic fibrosis. The husband has tested negative for the 96 marker panel. Are you done? No. Now what you guys need to do is to completely sequence the negative partner. I have had in my program in the last year probably four couples where, <laughs> where the negative partner actually had a rare allele and the couple was at risk. Okay, and fortunately we have been able to find, we found one affected case and three were carriers. Okay, let's switch to chromosomes. In 1970, only about 5% of deliveries were to women over 35 in the U.S. and in Western Europe. By 1990 it went up to about 10%, now it's about 15%, <coughs> and in, in sections of Manhattan 
It's like 25%. In 1970, the average 40-year-old who was pregnant was a woman who had been married for 20 years having her fourth kid. Today, it's a professional woman having her first kid. And the approach to that pregnancy is obviously quite different for most of them than it would have been 40 years ago. Now, in 1970, only about 2% of women, 2% of births were to women at 35 having their first baby. Now it's up to 12%. Only about 0.2% were births of women over 40 having their first baby, and now it's up to 2%. That's still a lot of women with very high risks who did not necessarily appreciate their risk. Well, over the years, we have seen many, many incremental changes in screening. As I said, the first test, the maternal age test, was, well, what, what's the lab test? Look at her birth, look at her driver's license, see when the birthday is. Okay? If she's over 35, you go, oh my God, she's at high risk, and it has a 35% sensitivity for about a 15% false positive rate. Okay? Then we went to low AFP. That brought us up to 50%, lower the false positive rate. Then we went double, triple, quadruple screening, added all, which got us into the 60s, added the nuchal translucency ultrasound, got us to 85 and 90. And now, with the non-invasive prenatal screening techniques, not diagnostic, not testing, we get high 90s for a very low false positive rate. Okay? The nuchal translucency was the game changer about 15 years ago. Okay? Even in Langdon Down's original paper in 1866, they knew that, the, that there was a large nuchal, the skin is deficient in elasticity, too large for the baby. But notice the title of the paper, Observation on an Ethnic Classification of Idiots. In the 19th century, the terms idiot, moron, and imbecile were legitimate medical terms defining differing degrees of retardation. And it was only as those words became incorporated into the lay language that they took on their pejorative characteristics. I mean, just imagine 50 years from now what the word Congress is going to mean. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one, one of the reasons that NIPT is not the be-all and end-all is because that's focused on Downs. We know that if you have a four millimeter nuchal translucency, the chance that that fetus has a chromosome abnormality is about 20%. That's the positive predictive value, okay? However, <coughs> if the chromosomes are normal, there still is another 10% chance that there's something else seriously wrong. And there have been over a hundred different syndromes that have now been associated with large NT normal chromosomes. Please remember two, cardiac abnormalities and Noonan syndrome. Each of those are about 3% each. The rest of those are very rare, okay? But that's one of the reasons it has to be thought about. And we're, we're seeing a lot of people, a lot of docs now who <coughs> I have a doc in my community, used to send me all her nuchals. Now she does her own free fetal DNA, does no 12 week ultrasound for the nuchal. Then she does an amnio at 17 weeks to quote confirm it. And we only see the patient at 20 weeks for the ultrasound. In the last year, we have found in her patients three serious anomalies, two of which I would have found at 12 weeks. Okay? And it's just cruel and unusual punishment to make patients wait that extra two months. Did a study a few years ago that on 20,000 first trimester screens, 5.7% sorry, <coughs> 5 were Down syndrome screen positive. Of those, 4% actually had an abnormality, 1 in 25. That's pretty good in our business. Okay? However, of that 4%, 40% of them weren't Down syndrome. They were something else. 
And when you add in the 13s and 18s and the crossback, it's at least 18 to 20 percent are not something you would find. We see a lot of docs who will do a first trimester combined, they'll do a nuchal translucency or a combined screen. They'll come back at risk. They'll say, okay, let's do an NIPT. Okay? Well, if it comes back abnormal two weeks later, you then need an amnio or a CVS to find out what to confirm it. And if it comes back normal, you then need a CVS or an amnio to find out what actually happened. Okay, so you basically just kick the can down the road. And what it's doing is allowing docs who don't do CVS to stall until they're in the mid trimester so they can do their own amnio, as opposed to sending it to one of the medical centers where they have people who know what they're doing with CVS. Now, People sit in my office all day long and say, doctor, I'm concerned about having a baby with Down syndrome. What they, whoops, what they really mean is they're concerned about having a baby with a serious problem and Downs is the name they happen to know. Okay? It's kind of like <laughs> when we were kids, your mother might have asked you to go to the grocery store and buy her some Jello. You didn't realize back then it was a brand name and there were six other brands you could have bought. You thought it was a product. So what you're actually getting is the right answer to the wrong question by focusing in so much on these few things. Now, the argument has been forever that <coughs> generals always prepare for the last war. The problem is in our business, the goalposts are always moving. And basically, we have seen just as the non-invasive screening people caught up to where we were 15 years ago, now we moved ahead. Okay? Now in PGD, this slide courtesy of Mark Hughes, we went from fish probes, and now this is Mark's slide that will show you all the different technologies and what they can do and what they can't do. Okay? That lecture Mark will give you. You, you, know, you know the concept well. But the point is it's so focused on a small number of patients and is also focused on some very important things, but it's not the entire picture. I counsel patients that, you know, we do our CVSs, our microarrays. It's a universe of genetic problems, some of which have ultrasound findings. That there's a separate universe of structural problems, some of which have an underlying genetic component. And then there is a teratogenic circle, some of which are potentiated by genetics, some of which have structural abnormalities. It's kind of like the Olympic flag, you know, with the in interlocking concentric circles. That's a concept that patients seem to understand. But my take on PGD is the last SART statistics suggest it's about 6% of IVF. Mark, that seems too low to me these days. You think so? He's still in Prague. <laughs> Jet lag got to him. Okay. Uh, many, many Mendelian disorders can be done that way. 24 chromosome arrays are replacing fish. There, there will continue to be mistakes. It's getting lower, but it's not going to be zero. And the take home message is that all PGD patients still need CVS to confirm. Because we're, on average, we're finding at least 1% mistake rate. The risk of a chromosome abnormality in a 38-year-old is 1%. So that's still high risk in my category, in my book. The real fight that we're seeing on my side of the equation, you know, once you, once you guys have gotten them pregnant, is NIPS versus the microarrays. Okay? We've known for 30 years that you can take a maternal blood specimen and sometimes see a fetal cell with trisomy 21. Uh, at Wayne, we were one of the principal investigators of the NIH fetal cells and maternal blood trial. I got about $5 million from them. We thank them very much. Technique didn't work. It was not ready yet for prime time. Made a couple of nice papers, but didn't work. We did learn something interesting, however, is that we have always believed that the placental barrier was a real barrier. We now know it's a sieve. If you look at, we know that certain disorders like lupus, shogun's, scleroderma, okay, Hashimoto's, the autoimmune disorders, are much more common in women than men, but not in nuns, figuratively and literally. 
Okay? And then if you do a biopsy of a scleroderma lesion in a woman, you'll often find a Y chromosome probe in there. It's a reaction to the pregnancy. It's a reaction to the father's DNA. Okay? And this actually is helpful. Then in 1997, my friend Dennis Lowe, then at Oxford, now back in Hong Kong, said maybe instead of looking for fetal cells, you guys are throwing away the baby with the bathwater. Let's look for the broken down DNA. We know in the first trimester that the placenta is a very rapidly growing organ. But for every gram of placental tissue that's laid down, at least five times that much is made and destroyed. And so if we take a blood specimen from everybody who's not, all the guys in this room, there will be a certain percentage <coughs> of broken down DNA in your bloodstream. In, in pregnant women, about as much as 10% of that comes from the fetus, more specifically from the placenta. And so the whole idea was to look for that to see if you could distinguish the DNA from the fetus from that of the mother. Now we know, and again without going through a huge amount of the, the technology here because you know it, with 36 base pair primers you can predict to virtually 100% certainty where each probe came from, where each segment came from. And, can, and basically you can sort them through the, through the mass, massive parallel uh, shotgun sequencing into this one's from chromosome one, two, three, four. It's like FedEx, okay? You're going to Chicago, you're going to Detroit, you're going to Los Angeles, you're going to New York, okay? Now we've learned, we've known, that chromosome 21 represents 1.32% of all the fetal, of all the DNA. At two copies is 1.3%. A baby with Down syndrome will have 2%. Gee, that's three copies. So the question is, how can you find those three copies amongst the sea of maternal DNA? And the answer is, with, non, uh, with the next generation sequencing, you can. Now, obviously, it's not exactly 1.32%. Like everything else, there is a bell curve. So you get your mean, your standard deviations, and more than three standard deviations, you say, OK, that looks like it's chromosome 21. And in fact, you can do this for all the chromosomes with the whole genome sequencing. And for Down syndrome, it's multiple standard deviations, typically, above what you'd expect. Now, <coughs> there are two methodologies that are on the market. One is the whole genome sequencing I've talked about. One of the arguments against it is you're doing a hell of a lot of work just to look for chromosome 21. Wouldn't it be cheaper to just look at chromosome 21? And so there are those companies that are focused on just chromosome 21. But I submit to you that the future of this is not Down syndrome, it's all the other stuff. If you are a whole genome sequencer and you want to add a new disease, you already have the DNA, you just need the bioinformatics. But if, you, but if you're a targeted pro person, you have to go get the, new D, get the DNA from square zero for the new disease and then get the bioinformatics. So ultimately, the expensive test is cheap and the cheap test is expensive, okay? Now, in the past five years, there have been many papers that are now showing close to 100% sensitivity for Downs with, quote, very low false positive rates. But, hypothetical, if a, if a test gives you a 100% accurate answer, if you get a result, but you only get a result 90% of the time, is that a 100% test or is that a 90% test? The lab people tend to say, oh, that's a 100% test. You gave us the proper specimen, we gave an answer. The clinicians are going, uh-uh, I've got 10% of my patients really mad at me that we don't have a result. And all we've done is kick the can down the road. Now, we've known that if you do it too early, the labs say 10 weeks, I say closer to 11, 11 and a half, you have a, a good chance of not getting a result. But importantly, in patients with a high BMI, the failure rate can be as much as 40 to 50%. What's happening is adipose tissue breaks down and dumps a lot of free maternal DNA into the circulation. So your denominator goes way up, 
so your fraction goes way down. Okay? But the really, really important one is abnormal cases are more likely to fail. So if you've done a free fetal DNA and you, you get a no call, do not repeat it. Send it to your, your, your neighborhood locally needle or catheter sticker to get a real answer. Because you've doubled the odds that there's a problem. Just on the failure alone. Now, <coughs> one of my interests for many years has been in technology assessment. I spent time early in my career with the National Center for Healthcare Technology, which is now the AHRQ. How do we bring new tests into practice? We know that with new technologies, there's a period of diffusion, uh, of development, where a small number of investigators, commonly at academic centers, but not always, have an idea, they work on it, they perfect it, they make it grow. Then they reach a point where they can't do everything, other people get involved, and the technology diffuses out across the country. Like night followeth day, we know that the numbers go up and the complications skyrocket. Guess what? Same thing here. Paper published out of North Carolina last year showed that before NIPT, this is a red state, only 11% of people had procedures. That fell to 8.8. Notice also that the drop was all in the amnio group and actually CVSs went up. Went up for two reasons. People were forced to crystallize out of their own head. Am I looking for an excuse not to have a test? Or do I want an answer and I want it now? Okay? And, but what they found was the sensitivity in the study was not 99%, not 98%, 87.5. The <laughs> specificity was a half a percent, was 99.5 if they got an answer, but 11% got no answer. So therefore, it's not as good as it seems. Now, just so you understand, and again, I got no vested interest in any of this, the companies that are doing the sequencing are Sequinom and Veronata. The targeted pro people are Ariosa and Natera. Okay? Now, here's the other problem. All these tests start with high-risk patients. The money is in low-risk patients. So if you want to look at the effect of any screening test in, say, 28-year-olds, okay? <coughs> let's do a study, hypothetical. 99% sensitivity, 99% specificity. Let's say we have 100 Down syndrome babies born to 28-year-olds. That means we'll find 99, we'll miss one. Okay, that's what we said it would be, pretty good. But in order <coughs> to have 100 Down syndrome babies to 28-year-old mothers whose incidence is 1 in 800, we need 80,000 pregnancies. Okay, so we're going to have v almost 800 false positives. So my positive predictive value is not 98%, not 75%, not 50%. It's 11%. That's a 3 millimeter NT. Okay? So you got to be, we know that the sensitivity and specificity do not vary with prevalence, but the predictive values do. Your, your patient doesn't care that of all the babies in the country with Down syndrome, we can find 90%, 99%. All she wants to know is, am I carrying a baby with Down syndrome? That's positive predictive value. And this is where these companies sometimes lie with statistics. Now, can we replace the biochemistry and the NT with just the NIPT? If you have a positive NIPT in a patient whose combined screen, free beta, PAP A, NT, was one in 10 risk, there's a 99% chance it's correct. But if it was low risk, you're down to that 11% we talked about. So it's a big modulator of the positive predictive value of this screening technology. Now, paper published recently from Baylor and from Hong Kong found that the positive predictive value in a high risk cohort for Down syndrome was 91% but for trisomy 13 was only 54%, and for Turner's was only 38%. Many of you now know, okay, up, that slide's out of order, but I'm gonna go, 
Now, I'll do this one now. Okay. <coughs> had a patient we saw last month. She had a 29 year old, had a first trimester combined screen of less than 1 in 10,000. She also then had a Harmony test that said 99% risk for Turner syndrome. Her doc then made her wait three weeks to do an amnio because he didn't want to send away the CVS. Does the amnio himself. Comes back normal male on fish. Tells her everything's okay. Carrier type shows an unbalanced XY translocation with X duplication and Y deletion. So why do we have Turner syndrome and normal male? Any non-geneticists want to answer that question? All right. Answer is that the region of the Y chromosome that was used for the Harmony test was what was deleted. But the reason, but the region of the Y chromosome for the fish was there. So that's why we see it. Okay? And the karyotype said unbalanced translocation, the microarray confirmed it. Okay? So what do we, we, turns out this patient's husband was the brother of a nurse who works in my program. Not for me, but so she called and said, what? You know, help. So first thing we did was do an ultrasound, and the genitalia were normal male. Tested the father, his carrier type was normal male. So what we now know in this particular case is that these children grow up into be perfectly normal, anatomically, sexually normal functioning males, but they're infertile. And they chose to continue the pregnancy, which is fine. Okay? So there's a whole, there's a whole, teaching, whole teaching semester in this one case here. You know, of how things can get, and of course the doc, you know, many of the docs have no clue what's going on. A friend of mine, Howard Cuckle, <coughs> has shown that by replacing our standard screening with NIPT, the cost to find the first case of Down syndrome that you now find that you would have missed is three and a half million dollars. Okay, from a public health point of view, that's very expensive break-even point is about $350. Okay? We found in American data the same thing. Okay. A lot of the labs are now saying, oh, we can do micro deletions also. And they're adding test after test after test. However, the positive pred predictive value for 22Q, it's a pretty important one, it's 5%. You got to do 19 CVS's or amnios that are normal to find the one that's not. Prater Willie, 4.6%. Angelman, 3.8%. You start piling up these other diseases with low performance characteristics, your false positive rate is not going to be the 0.2%, it's back to 5% again. Okay? So it's really caveat emptor in terms of what these things can do. Now, recently, one of the companies, Sequinom, has just come out with doing the whole genome. Okay? It's called Maternity 21 Genome. They have markers on all 24 chromosomes, probes about every 50,000 paces apart, but they're only calling it <coughs> if it's bigger than 7 megabases, which is equivalent to a carrier type. Okay? That's the good news is it's a step towards a non-invasive microarray. The bad news is major questions about what the false positive rate is going to be and it could explode them okay we don't know about the ratio of false cvs's to true positives could be problematic adding on the specific mic uh, problems with the snips the cms just issued reimbursement rates for the chips that are way low and actually threatens the entire industry okay that's good that's a real problem and even if this mimics the carrier type with the microarray I'm about to show you, we've moved so far beyond that, it's not even funny. Okay, my friend John Williams, who's the CVS guy in Los Angeles, just published a paper that showed that his vol number one, large cytogenetic labs are reporting volume drops of over 30%. He has seen a drop of over 28%. Okay, people not coming because they're having the NIPT. The really scary part is his referrals for patients with non-NIPT related disorders can't be done by NIPT, they've dropped 20%. People are drinking the Kool-Aid, 
that they can do everything by NAPT, and this is going to be a public health and medical legal disaster coming down the road. Okay, from all these mistakes that are being made. I, mean, I basically describe NIPT as the best thing in obstetrics since diethylsilbestrol, <laughs> the way it's being done. I was trained by Arthur Herbst. I think about everything in those, those terms. Okay, new paragraph. <coughs> if you look at a developmentally challenged child and do a microarray, you'll find an abnormality in 15 to 20% of them. Okay? Pediatricians no longer do karyotypes. If they have a dysmorphic child, they go straight to microarray because it's a much higher yield. Okay? We know <coughs> that there are many disorders, the George, Miller Deeker, Prado Willi, Smith McGinnis, Wolf Hirschhorn, that have duplications or deletions too small to be seen by the routine karyotype, okay? which the microarray can pick up. Some disorders, like 1P36, you can have small deletions or big deletions. This one you'll find on karyotype, that, that one you, you won't. Okay? Think of it this way. If you look at an old style television set, the number of pixels, the number of dots that make up the picture are about 500,000. If you look at a high def television, it's two million. It's a four fold increase in clarity. The difference between the standard karyotype and the routine microarray is a 30-fold magnification. We're seeing a lot of stuff we did not see before. Now, the NIH collaborative paper published in 2012 showed that in patients with an ultrasound abnormality and a normal karyotype, every number on this chart includes a normal karyotype, that they were finding between the stuff that was guaranteed to be abnormal and, the stuff, and stuff that was likely abnormal close to 6%. What got my attention was in patients who had nothing else going on. The history was normal, the ultrasound was normal, the karyotype was normal. The minimum abnormality of guaranteed pathology was 1 in 200. That's the risk of a 35-year-old. We've been telling women for four decades that's high enough to think about having a procedure. Okay? What we have found over the past five, you know, every time we have something new, those of you who know prenatal ultrasound, remember, choroid plexus cyst was found in the 1990s. Oh my God, they're all trisomy 18. With everything new, you get your numerator before you get your denominator. And only when you recognize that something is potentially problematic, do you then be go looking for the other cases, and the risk goes down, down, down. With DES, when they first discovered those teenage girls in the early 70s, they thought that 70% of them would develop cancer. Then, it went, then as they began looking, it went from 70% to 10% to 1% to 1 in, 10, 1 in 1,000 for cancer. The other injuries are far more prevalent. Okay? For the variance of uncertain significance, it's gone from 2.5% at the beginning now to under 1%. One of the things we always do when we get a microarray is get parental bloods. Because as we see stuff that's unusual, first question is, do one of the kids have it? Do one of the parents have it? We did this on my daughter-in-law, okay? She came back with a duplication on 14Q. I'm going, ooh. And then I pull up my, my stepson's blood. He's got the same thing. So if you think he's normal, and we can have that discussion later, <laughs> okay? Uh, my, so my anxiety level lasted one second. That's the reason we have to do this till we get more numbers. Okay, where we're going, in some of this data is not even published yet, is that <laughs> in the patients with no abnormality, the minimum chance of finding a guaranteed pathologic C and V is now up to 1%, 1 in 100. Everybody is 38. <coughs> we offer CVSs and microarrays to 22 year olds because their risk is that of a 38-year-old. And overall in my program, we're finding about a 1% abnormality rate. And that's what the big labs are finding as well. Published in the psychiatry literature, general screening, genes highly associated with developmental delay and psychiatric disorders in one in 500 patients, just by itself. Okay, now, 
switch paragraphs, procedures. The era of the amniocentesis as the main procedure needs to be finished. Several papers now show over the past decade, what I've been saying for 30 years, <coughs> is that in experienced hands, CVS is just as safe as amnio. Okay? Meta-analysis from seven, eight years ago, within two weeks of an amnio, total loss rate, including background, 0.6%, 0.9 to 24 weeks, 1.9. For CVS done a month earlier, 0.712, exactly the same. Recent paper from uh, Denmark, CVS is actually, if anything, even lower loss rate in experienced hands. And in fact, has a lower late complication rate than amniocentesis. Now, I personally do more of these on twins, triplets, and quads than singletons. Okay, here's a triplet pregnancy. A has a low anterior placenta, I'll do this one cervically. B is anterior fundal, I'll come down with a needle, and you can see my catheter coming into C. Okay? I describe it to patients this way. Think of the cervix as home, pl as, as home, pl home, pl uh, cervix as home plate. If the placenta is up the first baseline or the third baseline, I can come in from below, but if it's in center field, we have to come in from the bullpen, abdominally. Usually all the husbands are going, yeah, and half the wives are going, what is he talking about? <laughs> And when I lecture in Europe on this, nobody has a clue. <laughs> yeah. So our approach is when I'm seeing patients with multiples who are considering reduction, we test w at least one more than we're planning on keeping, which virtually guarantees that we do fish overnight and reduction the next afternoon. The accuracy of the fish is more than 99%, and if the ultrasound is normal, the chance that there's something else that we didn't find is about, about 1 in 400. In fact, we published it recently with one sex chromosome discordancy. Okay? It was a mosaic. So the question is, what should we be doing? Okay? I believe, not the standard of care statement, but it's my personal belief, that to be doing reductions without prior genetics is just nuts. Okay? Triplet pregnancy. This one was smaller. Had I been doing the reduction just based upon the ultrasound, I would have reduced this one. That one turned out to have downs. Couple who were CF carriers, this took more than overnight, turned out that two, two were carriers, one was affected. Obviously reduced the affected one. Uh, remember the movie Four Weddings and a Funeral? We now have a new concept based upon four gametes in a uterus. <laughs> Had a, a, a gay guy couple, they were using a surrogate, they had used two different egg donors, don't ask me why. Okay. Both guys had sprinkled both sets of eggs, don't ask me why. <laughs> they wound up with triplets. They wanted a reduction for the usual reason. And then the, one of the guys says to me, if everything else is okay, can I give them one from each of them? And I sit and think for a second and say, well, if it's there, yeah. Okay. Well, it turns out the CVS was all normal. The paternity analysis show one guy got two, the other one got one. So we reduced one of the twins, leaving them one from each. And we've now invented a new procedure that I've called paternity balancing. <laughs> now, if you think about this from a sociologic perspective, lots and lots of heterosexual couples have children to have a shared investment in the marriage. Doesn't always work, but the point is that, so why shouldn't it be the same? you know, for this community. Okay, reductions. We don't see too many septuplets anymore, but we do see some. And the point is, with, no, with multiples, no matter how many you start with, it's safer to have less. Okay? The numbers have gotten better over the years. Okay? And the bottom line is, even for twins to a single thing, which I'll come back to in a minute. The problem that we get from you folks is the dichorionic triamniotic triplets. You transfer two, one of them splits. Left to its own devices, this is a very high risk situation, okay? We ju just put together some data from my, my friends in the Netherlands, 14% pregnancy loss rate, 55% twin to twin transfusion rate between the twins, 23% had selective intrauterine growth restriction, neonatal mortality at one month, 18%. Ouch. Okay? 
about 7% of the patients I see for reductions have a monozygotic twin pair. Okay? The approach is we do single CVS on the singleton and once for the twins. Don't need them both. If the singleton is healthy, the safest thing is to keep the singleton, reduce the twins. If the singleton is not healthy, okay, we'll keep the identical twins. The one thing we cannot do is reduce one of the identicals. Okay? The problems of monozygosity are underappreciated. One of my problems with what has become the mantra of REI of elective single embryo transfer is you got at least a 3% twinning rate, maybe more. Okay? Monozygotic twins are not benign. Dizygotic twins are not benign, but they're a lot less worse than monozygotic. Okay? Paper published several years ago, death rate of dichorionic twins 4%, monochorionic 12. Preterm delivery 57, 68%. Here's the kicker. Neurologic compromise 1% per baby, 18% per baby. Okay? The next question is, well, what about the lady who starts with twins? Okay? When <coughs> I first invented this thing back in the early 80s, and we had no data, but I felt we needed to have some guidelines. I worked together with John Fletcher, who I told you about earlier, and we decided that we would not go below twins except in extremists. <coughs> and the rationale we used in the 80s was every OB could take care of twins. The outcome was not as good as with twins, singleton, but it was okay, particularly given how bad infertility therapies were back then. Okay? Most patients with infertility, most had no children. It got them family, close to the family planning desires. We didn't know what the risk would be. Was it we would it make matters worse by reducing two to one or not? It just didn't feel ethically justified. Well, there always turned out to be exceptions. The mother who was a dwarf, who had cardiac disease, uterine abnormalities, or fetal, abnorm or fetal abnormalities. And wh what we found <coughs> was that if you define success as healthy mother and healthy family, even for the woman who starts with twins, it's safer to go to a singleton, but not a monozygotics. We're talking dichorionics here, okay? The next question was an ethical one. If you believe that one to zero is ever acceptable, i.e. should a woman be allowed to have an abortion, then why not two to one? What we learned was that for the woman who has a twin pregnancy early on and tries to carry it, depending upon when you ask the question, her loss rates between 7 and 10% before viability. For patients on whom we do CVS and reduction, we cut it down to 2.5%. So it is safer to do it than to not do it. And for patients who say, well, I don't understand this, I said, look, isn't the 2.5% because you caused the problem? I said, no. If doctor says to you, I'm sorry, you have cancer, we should do surgery, certainly you can get into trouble on the table. But on balance, it's safer to have the surgery than keep the cancer. If you still died a year later, it doesn't mean the surgery killed you, it meant the surgery couldn't save you. Okay? And so it's safer to actually go ahead and do this, and that they go. And I also use the analogy that <laughs> one could make the argument that we never should have invaded Normandy on D-Day because we knew we were going to lose troops on the beach, whereas the bigger picture was to free Europe. Okay? I had a patient from Germany last week. I switched it to Iwo Jima in Japan. Boom. But same general concept. Okay? We're now seeing an, an ever-increasing rise in percentage of patients having it. Okay? Now it's about 25% of what we do. And we know that it, it decreases lost rate, prematurity, and obstetrical complications. Oops. Now, how many should we test? Some places, will, if you're going from three to two, they'll only test the two they think they're going to keep. We always test one more, or at, want to. Because number one, it virtually guarantees that we'll have two that are normal, and if they're all normal, we have some options, okay? Now, I used to get a phone call from somebody in Senator Hatch's office every year for like 20 years, wanting to know how many sex selection abortions are there going on out there. And my answer was, <coughs> I'm sure there's some, but I'm not seeing it. However, what we found, if you go back to the 90s, 
was of the patients who did have a gender preference, this is a vast overgeneralization, so please spot me the half hour non-political correct to get there, okay? Is that they overwhelmingly came from patients of Arab, Asian, and Indian backgrounds, all of whom wanted boys. I have always been a big believer, believer in the diagnosis of genetic disease, and last I looked, being female wasn't a disease. What we now, now see <coughs> is that it appears to be equally likely that patients want a boy and a girl, and that they want twins, okay? They seem to want both, okay? In terms of gender, the way that we decide what we're gonna do, reduce is first of all, do we find a problem? If not, am I still suspicious about something? You know what I'm talking about, okay? And then finally, if nothing else matters, and I mean that, <laughs> we have for the last 15 years been willing to take gender into account, okay? We find that patients fall into one of four different categories. People who want to know everything, people who want to know nothing, what I refer to as the old Sergeant Schultz answer, for those of you old enough to remember that show, okay? Patients who have no preference, but tell me what you kept. And finally, patients who say, all things considered, I do have the following preference. And what we have found is that the vast majority of people going to twins want one of each, okay? And that we published a couple years ago of patients going down to a singleton, it's even money whether they want a boy or a girl. So to me, it has answered from a public health perspective the challenge, oh, these are all just to have boys. It's not, at least not in this country. Okay, so the evolving question is, should we go from never reducing to a singleton to should we always be reducing to a singleton? And the answer is we should be offering it. The great divide, as I said earlier, is between dizygotic and monozygotic. The problem is if you try to reduce one of two monozygotic twins, if you put KCLN over here, guess what? It goes over there. 50% death rate, 70% abnormality rate. So we actually developed at Hutzel the idea of, of cord occlusion, tying off the umbilical cord to keep that from happening. It was a lot of fun. It was great advancement in science and medicine. But what we found was that even when you do this, the chance of an abnormal brain in the survivor is between 6 and 10%. That's just much too high and we refuse to do that, okay? Now, there are patients <coughs> who will do that for an abnormal twin, and you can argue that, but electively, uh-uh. Just simply far too dangerous to think about doing that as far as we're concerned. If one of the twins dies, risk of neurologic impairment can be 20 weeks. If they die naturally, it can be very high. Okay, so to try and wrap this all up, the public health crisis we're already living in is that nuchal translucency screening and ultrasounds have paradoxically increased the number of babies born with Down syndrome because people are not having the procedures that would have told them for sure. I'm concerned that the non-invasive stuff will increase the number of babies with other problems that could be discovered by actual diagnostic tests. The way I approach patients is say, look, for most patients in the middle 99%, it doesn't matter whether we do anything or not, everything will be fine. The question is, if you're gonna be wrong, which way would you rather be wrong? Would you rather take a small risk of having a baby with a problem <coughs> versus a smaller risk of having a complication because you wanted to know that? And you literally have to play one worst case scenario off against the other because the middle doesn't count, okay? And what it comes down to is tell me what you fear the most and we can reduce that at the expense of something else. The focus on Down syndrome alone is significantly understating the actual risks. NIPS is an excellent screening for Downs, but it's just far too expensive for routine use. Patients are being falsely reassured who otherwise would actually have diagnostic testing because they used to. Eliminating the NT, because NIPS can do everything as a false economy. And never before have we ever seen one technology essentially replace another 
that both simultaneously finds less and costs more. That's what we're living with right now. You know, I now know how Churchill felt in the late 30s when he was the only one jumping up and down, the sky is falling and nobody would listen to him. Yeah. When did CVS and Amio suddenly become so dangerous? When there is an abnormality, one third aren't what you thought you were looking for, so you can't use targeted probes. For the past four decades, a risk of one in 200 was considered high enough to offer diagnostic procedures. Now it's one in 100. Everybody's 38. The future is non-invasive deeper sequencing. The only question is whether it's going to be amniotic fluid, CVS, or non-invasively, or maternal blood. For the multiples, <coughs> reduction clearly reduces morbidity and mortality in higher orders. Loss rates and prematurity are still a function of the starting number. The safety of procedures is a direct correlative experience. Genetic diagnosis by CVS is safe, effective, and maximizes the chance of healthy survivors. Single embryo transfer does not solve all the issues. If you transfer two and you get three, I can fix that. You transfer one, you get two, we can't help you. That, I need you, that needs to really be thought about as the rush to single embryo transfer is occurring. Reduction of triplets dramatically improves outcome. Reduction of dichorionic twins also improve outcomes and should be discussed with all patients. Reduction of MC twins is very problematic and DCTA triplets can be fixed. Twins to singleton now represents about one third of the cases we do. It shouldn't be taken frivolously. Most multiples are, un are unavoidable. Some shouldn't be occurring. I don't have to say more of that. You guys know that. Now, <coughs> some docs I know basically frame every lecture is you got to send me every patient in the world. I have never done that and I never will do that. But for the first time in 30 years, I feel compelled to finish lectures with be a caveat emptor slide. Technology has never been greater. Confusion is rampant for patients and physicians. Risk to the provider for missed cases has never been greater. Documentation of the explanation to the patients has never been more important. And independent genetic counseling with documentation is actually the best protection for you that your patient was told all the risks and all their options. Okay, when we see patients, those of you who know, we send you back a four page letter. Now, three and a half pages of it is boilerplate, you know that, but it's on the patient's chart. That's the important point. Well, I've made a lot of predictions tonight. In 1940, Trotsky was assassinated in Moscow, in, in Mexico. <coughs> 25 year, years later at Oxford, they held a conference to review his contributions to 20th century world history. And the guy who ran it summar summarized it best. He said Trotsky's ideas were so far-sighted that not a single one of them had come true yet. <coughs> Hopefully we're doing somewhat better than that, but they won't all be right. Thank you. <laughs>